and welcome back. Uh, we have with us this morning the Right Honourable Patricia Scotland, who is the Commonwealth Secretary General. Good, Good morning. morning. And we appreciate you taking the time to uh, stop in during your visit and having this conversation with us. Um, and I want to start off by having our viewers understand what the role of the Secretary General is for Commonwealth. So let's start there. Well, um, as I hope many of your viewers will know, the Commonwealth is made up of 53 countries, of which Belize is one. It's a family. Belize became a member of the Commonwealth, the 47th member of the Commonwealth, in 1981 when uh, Belize got her wonderful independence. Mm -hmm. And ever since, she has been part of this family of nations. We are 2.4 billion people, 60% of whom are under the age of 30. Really bound by, I know it's a huge number, okay? The majority of the Commonwealth citizens are young, like ourselves, of course. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, but we're really bound by our values. Um, we're bound, we have all of us share the same uh, background history in as much as we all speak English. We are bound by the common law. We have a similar parliamentary system based on the Westminster model. Our institutions are the same. And so throughout the time that the Commonwealth has been together, we've been able to support each other and to help us craft a better future. And all of the heads of government, all 53 heads of government come together and they've created a secretariat who is able to act on behalf of all 53 countries. And the head of that secretariat is the Secretary General. And the Secretary General is, a, is elected by the 53 leaders to act on their joint behalf. And so we've just come back from the uh, United Nations General Assembly where we had a meeting in the margins of all the uh, foreign ministers to, to think about what do we care about, what's important to us. Mm -hmm. And every two years, the Commonwealth, all the 53 leaders come together to discuss where they're going, what they can do together, why things are important and what needs to change. And this happened this year in London in April. Mm -hmm. And it was a fabulous occasion. Because, as you know, the world is in a quite difficult place right now. And internationally, it's been very difficult for people to agree on almost anything. The G7, which is the seven greatest nations, came together, they couldn't agree. The G20, they couldn't agree. All the other constellations are not agreeing. And it was very worrying, because there are so many important things for us now. So the Commonwealth came together, and we said, OK, what about us? What about our common future? What do we have in our common future? And they thought, we have to think about how can we make ourselves more prosperous, mm -hmm. particularly for our children. There's a lot of unemployment and worry and concern. So what do we do about enhancing trade to make us richer? When I came in as uh, Secretary General, I said I wanted to put the wealth back into Commonwealth. But I also wanted to put the common back into wealth <laughs> because, you know, it's not always so even. And we have 31 small states in our Commonwealth of 53. So that was prosperity. The next question was how do we make ourselves more secure? Because we are living in this dangerous world. There's more terrorism and etc. So how do we pull together for security? Then there was the issue of environment because we know that climate change is, is a huge issue and poses an existential threat to the small nations. And so that was um, an issue for us. And then how do we make the world fairer? So these were four big issues. And everyone said, well, no, no constellation of 53 countries are going to agree on all of that. No way. When no one else can agree, they're not going to agree at all. But we did agree. 53 countries came together and we agreed on everything. And it's a real example of what we can do when we concentrate on what binds us as opposed to what separates us. And international law binds us. It gives us a fair platform where all of us can feel more equal and safer. Because the United Nations and the Commonwealth was really there to be an alternative 
to dissonance and war and disagreement. And so I'm really proud of our 53 countries. And it was clear when we came together, we really care about each other. And we're willing to give up things to help each other. And what I saw in April in London was actually leaders who loved each other. And that's a, you don't see that. If you go to the UN General Assembly, you don't always see a lot of love. <laughs> So the Commonwealth is a family, mm -hmm. and Belize is a really important member of that family. Now, as a representative of the Commonwealth, I'm sure uh, in meeting and discussing with different uh, foreign ministers, one of the areas I suppose would be a challenge is being able to meet collective need, but also individual needs. Yeah. Any, any country that's a member of a regional body or mm -hmm. international body wants to ensure that they have direct benefit as well. Yeah. And while the bigger picture, the common issues yeah. can be addressed, yeah. we also have local issues. Yeah. How, how do you manage? I think what we've done is we've tried to concentrate on what joins us mm -hmm. as opposed to what separates us. It's a bit like our DNA. 99.9% mm -hmm. .9 of every human being's DNA is identical. Right. The only thing that separates us is 0.1%. That's what makes us black or white, male or female, tall, short, mm -hmm. etc. And yet what we tend to do is to concentrate on that 0.1% that makes us different and not the 99.9% .9 which makes us the same. Mm -hmm. So what we have done in the Commonwealth is we've tried to think of the issues which bind us together. And we've tried to concentrate on those things first. And what we found is when you do that, then the differences that you have actually become a joy because nobody wants to be identical to anybody else. And you start to appreciate those differences and you've got a context in which those differences are no longer threatening but those differences are understandable and you can support them. So if you look at the things that we have been speaking about and working on in the Commonwealth, they are things which individual countries really care about. So if we go back to the fact that 60% of our Commonwealth is under the age of 30, everyone's caring about our children right now. They're worried about the fact that life is becoming more violent. They're worried about whether their children will get a better job. How do you get more prosperous? How do you make sure that they are safe? Those things are common. Mm -hmm. When we're looking at climate change, if you remember what happened last year, in the Commonwealth, every single region was touched. It started with mudslides in Sierra Leone. More than 200 odd people died. Then there was desertification across Africa, no water. Then there was flooding in uh, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and India. And then our region here in the Caribbean was ravaged by hurricanes. There was Irma, and we thought that was it because hurricanes normally come once in a lifetime, once in 72 years. So we thought we've had Irma, we're done. Then came Maria. I'm Dominican. Um, Maria hit us so hard, we'd already suffered from Tropical Storm Erica the year before. We were devastated by Maria, 230% of our GDP gone wow. like that. And we're still struggling to come back. 19 countries in our region were affected by that hurricane, mm -hmm. those hurricanes. It left that. We had cyclones, earthquakes in the Pacific. And even in Europe, there was Hurricane Ophelia for the first time. Look what's happening this year. Mm -hmm. We've got uh, floods and, uh, and, and earthquakes. We've got uh, tsunamis. Mm -hmm. And it may be Indonesia, but we know this is coming to us soon. So climate change is not just a global issue. It's a local issue. We look on the sea right here. And we know that people have taken away the mangroves. When you take away the mangroves, it means that the sea is going to come closer. The barriers aren't there. Mm -hmm. In Sri Lanka, the mangroves caused, the removal of the mangroves helped to create the tsunami. 
So these are global issues, yes, but they're locally mm -hmm. painful. And that's what we're joining together to talk about and to do something about. I'm, I'm, I'm happy that you're here. I, I was telling you, our camera, I was looking at your resume and I'm humbled. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to bring it a bit home mm -hmm. because I'm listening to everything that's happening in the rest of the world mm -hmm. and it also brings me to believe that Belize has been relatively blessed mm -hmm. in terms of some of the things that we've avoided and yes. not have to deal with here. Mm -hmm. My question is, how, from your observation, how has Belize been able to put its issues on the table to get participation or help mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. other members of CARICOM while it has been participating mm -hmm. as a member? of this body? Well, um, for Belize, uh, the membership of the Commonwealth, I think, has been really important. You'll know that uh, for 41 years now, every single year, uh, the issue of Belize's sovereignty has been raised in the Commonwealth meetings every single year for 41 years. And the support that the international community has given to Belize is intensified by the support the Commonwealth has given to Belize because there has been an issue about uh, the sovereignty of Belize and its territorial integrity. And the Commonwealth has been absolutely clear for those 41 years that Belize's sovereignty and integrity should be preserved and the whole of the Commonwealth family, that is all 2.4 billion people of us, have said we stand together and we stand with Belize. And you know, it's very easy for people sometimes to look at our small islands. I, Dominica is only 72,000, so you're, you lot are big guys, <laughs> <laughs> big guys. Okay, to say we are small and because we're small, we're irrelevant and we stand on our own not when we are part of a family of 2.4 billion. So when any country, any other country looks at us, they have to remember they're not just looking at 380,000 people. They're not just looking at 72,000 people or St. Kitts and Nevis, who I think have 50,000 people or Nauru in the Pacific, who only has 11 or 12,000. You could say, well, you know, no, 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 do not mistake yourself. When you look at any of us, you're looking at 2.4 billion people mm -hmm. and we stick together. So from Belize's point of view, it has had the trenchant support of the Commonwealth and the United Nations to say, we stand with you for the preservation of your integrity. Mm -hmm. And I think that has been an extremely important uh, element for all these years. Can I, can I ask as well, from a, from a practical as a lay person, mm -hmm. yeah. not understanding the niceties of international diplomacy yes. and politics, what specifically does, does that support yeah. mean on the ground? Yeah. What it means is that um, the countries of the Commonwealth, having looked at the position and the contentions between uh, the claims made about Belize's territory by Guatemala, the Commonwealth has said, we have looked at the legal structure and we believe that Belize is entitled to the whole of its territory. Mm -hmm. And we will stand with Belize against anyone who says that's not correct. So when Guatemala comes to say, we are making a claim on Belize's territory, the Commonwealth and the United Nations are in a position to say, let's look at the legal position that you are claiming, my friend, and we don't agree. And it's not just that we're saying Belize is our friend, you know, and because you're, no, 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 no. We've looked at the legal position and the legal position seems to the Commonwealth, and this is this is taken on an international law level, not what's happening in the country, because we know that um, uh, countries will be of different political complexion from time to time. Yeah. One time you'll have this government, one yes. time you'll have another government, you like this government, you don't like that government, fine. But it's the integrity of your country 
which goes beyond that. And we're looking at what the law says. And it's absolutely clear. Um, this position has been so for 524 years. Hmm? Guatemala has never exercised any territorial authority over Belize, ever. This matter was settled 159 years ago. And throughout that whole period, Guatemala has never exercised territorial authority. They have not been in control of Belize ever. And so it's very clear from the Commonwealth's point of view, particularly, yes, because uh, um, uh, Belize is part of our family, that there is no lawful claim. And for many years, um, people internationally have been trying to encourage settlement of this issue and encourage Guatemala to say, OK, if you believe, contrary to what everybody else has defined, that this is a claim which is justified, go to the ICJ and convince the 15 international judges that your claim is there. And Guatemala has never been willing to do that until this April. And the Commonwealth has been urging, the 53 countries have been urging them to do it, urging them to bring this issue to an end. Because in the end, when you have conflict between two countries, and one is saying one and the other is saying the other, the only way of bringing it finally to a conclusion, peacefully, mm -hmm. hmm, peacefully, is to get a determination by the International Court of Justice. That's what the court does when countries don't agree. Guyana is going to go to the International Court because Guyana and Venezuela have had this thing. Nigeria and Cameroon, two members of our Commonwealth, were in disagreement about the border between Nigeria and Cameroon. They had to go to the International Court to get a final determination so there will be peace. For so long as that doesn't happen, claims can always be made. I could sit here and say, I really like that dress. I think that dress should be mine. I believe it would look better on me than on you. So the fact that you are much slimmer than me, I don't care, and it won't affect me. <laughs> but I can claim anything. Doesn't mean it's mine, doesn't mean I bought it, doesn't mean I'm entitled to it, but I can claim it. And the only way, if we're going to disagree, that we can decide this is say, OK, madam, if you think this is your dress, go to court. Give me your receipt. Show me how you bought it. Ernest, you, your visit here, uh, in addition to having several meetings and discussions, it is to uh, articulate the perspective of Commonwealth on whether or not Belizeans should take this claim to the, should agree to take the claim to the ICJ. Mm -hmm. um, are you promoting a particular decision no, from the Belizeans? No, I, I need to challenge that. Mm -hmm. I have come to talk about um, what the Commonwealth is doing t towards a common future. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot. So for instance, I'd like to talk about trade mm -hmm. because we have a 19% advantage in the Commonwealth yeah. trading to, with each other. We've got now at the World Trade Organization a trade facilitation agreement, mm -hmm. which will mean if we can take away the barriers of trade, we will be able to enhance the trade between all of our countries. At the moment, the trade between the Commonwealth countries is at 585 billion. Mm -hmm. We believe that we could get it to 700 billion by 2020, maybe even a trillion. There's lots of things that I have come to yeah. talk about, which is about our future. Now, I understand that many people would like me to talk about this issue, but I need to be really, really clear. I can share with people what the international law says. I can share with them the view of the Commonwealth. I can share with them what the international legal position is. But the decision as to whether to say yes or no is not mine. 
the decision has to be made by the people of Belize for themselves listening to the various arguments. That's what we believe in in the Commonwealth. We believe that there is an autonomy and the citizen has to choose. Not one way or another, they have to listen and then decide for themselves. Mm -hmm. It's not part of my role to come and say, you should do this, you should do that. My only role yeah. is to tell people the facts. What they then decide to do with the facts is a matter for the people of Belize. Can I ask if there has been any conversation with the international community or Commonwealth representatives as to what alternatives we may seek if Belizeans yeah. decide to vote mm -hmm. no to taking the claim to the ICJ? Well, it's a matter, as I say, for the Belizean people. Because for 41 years, the Commonwealth, including Belize, has been saying we want this settled. For 41 years, the Commonwealth has been saying we stand with the Belize on the integrity of your sovereignty. And for 41 years, we have been trying, as an international community, mm -hmm. to get Guatemala to come to the table. Mm -hmm. And many thought they would never, ever do it. Because the referendum, as I understand it, is not about Belize's integrity. This referendum is about what to do with Guatemala's claim. Mm -hmm. And so the question we ask ourselves is, if not this, how do we finally determine Guatemala's claim to Belize? How do we stop them? Mm -hmm. If not this, how? In, I, in, in terms of talking about uh, common ground, um, I think that all Belizeans are unified, and we're unified with CARICOM that Guatemala is wrong. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think it's a question of how do we get them to realize that they're wrong. Yeah. Um, but one of the things that impressed me um, was that on your visit, I am aware that you've been consulting with both persons who have one view and people yes. who have a no view, which yeah. to me was impressive. Yeah. Um, one of the things that some of the no votes mm. uh, locally have been saying and this is a ticklish position, mm. was that Belize kind of got tricked. Mm. What we are faced with, with the problem that Guat Guatemala being wrong, mm. is a problem between our political parents, the UK, the Commonwealth head, and Guatemala. Mm. We really got tricked into it. And really and truly, some people in Belize would wish that the mother country would come and fix a problem that they left for the mm. children. Mm. What is CARICOM's view on that? I know it's a ticklish position. Well, the thing is, um, a number of things flow from the decision when um, Belize took its independence mm -hmm. in September 1981. It became an independent country. And it took on the sovereignty issues at that stage. Mm? In 1981, Belize's sovereignty was assured by a, by a treaty which had been operating successfully without any dissent from Guatemala for more than 110 years. So if you look at it jurisprudentially, in terms of legally, what passed from the United Kingdom to Belize at that moment was sovereign independence which gave Belize an opportunity to run herself, to govern herself. So this separation took place in September 1981. So the United Kim Kingdom's sovereignty over Belizean land came to an end and Belizean people took up their sovereignty at that point. So I think we need to be very clear, this is not a dispute any longer by a foreign power, which is what the United Kingdom now is. This is now a dispute between Belize and Guatemala. And what the Commonwealth can do, including the United Kingdom, 
is to stand with Belize to say, we have looked at the legal position. You had no right before 1981. You had no right after 1981. And you cannot, after 524 years of never exercising sovereignty of this country, suddenly wake up and think you own it. It's not going to happen in terms of international law. And what we have is, we can have two ways of determining disputes between countries on territories. The old-fashioned way, which is the way nobody wants, is to go to war with them. But you know what happens? Even at the end of a conflict, you end up going back to the law to determine it. If you look at what happened to Germany, what happened to any, after every war, you end up going back to get to the settlement. So whatever we have done, the international community, since 1945, said we don't want to settle disputes in that old way. We want to settle them lawfully. And that's why the international court yes. was can created. We, can we explore a bit further the financial aspect of uh, the Guatemalan claim over Belize? You were here in 2016 when there was a flare-up of sorts in the adjacency zone. The adjacency zone is funded by the international community. When we had an exit interview with the uh, outgoing British High Commissioner, he spoke of what uh, he termed donor fatigue um, in this area, which gives an added perspective as to where the motives may be from uh, the international community as to why this issue may need to be resolved now. Can you shed some light or some perspective on the idea that perhaps larger countries are just saying we're tired of spending money on this area and on cooperation uh, issues? Maybe you should just settle it in court and we can put our money somewhere else. Well, I, I, I don't want to speak for the donors, but what I will say is that many would like to concentrate on things which really are of pivotal importance to the ordinary day to day. So, we all have choices. If we want to spend money on schools, on children, on building our roads and climate change and uh, building up trade and making things fairer, making our court systems work, hmm, there's all of us have a finite amount of money. And so we make our choices. And if there is an opportunity to settle something which is making life much more difficult, for both parties, then the international community is going to support both sides to come to that solution. And I am confident that there has been a lot of diplomatic pressure put on Guatemala to finally come to the table because they must know, and indeed I understand when the lawyers um, their lawyers were asked about the consequence of their April referendum and were asked, well, do you think you, Guatemala, are going to succeed? They said no. Then they asked them, well, do you think it's going to be partly successful? And they said it all falls or succeeds together. So what is your estimate as to whether you will win or not? And they said, we think we're going to lose. <laughs> so, so, but you have to look at it from their point of view. It's very difficult politically to give up a claim. Hmm? To say, okay, we know we never really had any right to Belize uh, and we're going to give up. So how do you get out of that political issue? You go to court. And when the court says you have no claim, then politically it's much easier. So I think if you look at what the Commonwealth heads of government said, in their last communique in April, they were urging Guatemala and Belize to come to a resolution, urging Guatemala and Belize to go to the ICJ to determine Guatemala's claim against Belize. There was no suggestion at all that the Commonwealth did not agree with Belize that Belize is entitled to the whole of her 
territory. So what they're saying is, we stand with Belize. We believe that Belize has sovereignty and territorial integrity. No question about that. We've been saying that for 41 years. However, I'm not saying enough already, but <laughs> enough already. Um, Guatemala now needs to go to the ICJ and finally determine it. So they're encouraging both Guatemala and Belize, but it's for the people of Belize, just as it was for the people of Guatemala to decide what they want to do. The international community can't decide this. They can't decide it for you because the people who will be dealing with the consequences of a no or yes are the people of Belize. Absolutely, absolutely. May, may I ask this? Um, the, the narrative has really been put to us locally that we either go to court or we go to war. Um, it's been put that dryly to us. Mm. And it kind of irks us wrongfully, rubs us wrongfully. Mm. Um, my question is, we had a guest yesterday who was a mm. member of the military, and he was looking at it and saying, listen, internationally, it's kind of ridiculous to say go to war. War in 2018 is improbable under these circumstances. Mm. And for me, I looked at it and I said, yeah, he's probably right or probably wrong. Mm. What's the probability of, of war well, is it just fear mongering? Well, I'm um, not, I'm, and I really think that I can't uh, comment on that. What I can say is that the best way of settling any dispute is settling it peacefully. What? And I think what's likely to happen is you'd have a continuation of what hap is happening now. Yes. So things aren't. I think things aren't going to change, they're not going to get better. Think about all the distress. I will never forget in 2016, I went to a school uh, here in Belize and I went to ask young children, they were under the age of you know, 10, 11, they were little children, and I just asked them, uh, what would you like to do and what would you like to happen in your future? You know, and I expect them to say, well, I'd like to do this, I'd like to do that. I was so shocked. You know what those children told me when I said, what would you like in the future? They said, peace with Guatemala. And that told me that these children's minds were full of fear. What's Guatemala going to do? Now, this was at a time when there was tension because um, there was a young person young who had been killed and the tension was really raised. But in these children's minds, they were totally consumed by the fear of what Guatemala was going to do. What? Now that is not a good way for our children to live. We need to give them some peace. Maybe you came, right, I, maybe you came right after a social studies class. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was a dominant conversation at that time. But you know, I think fear is an important, it, it, we cannot just put it aside that there is an existing fear about this issue, whether it's about invasion, because yep. the military had been deployed to the Sarstun yes. and the border at that time in 2016, yes. but also a fear of going to court. And, and, and as, a, mm. as a legal mind, that's where I want to, I yep. want to uh, take this next question. You know, Belizeans are being told we have a solid case. Mm -hmm. In other words, there's no way we will lose in any way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. That is just a pill that no one can digest. Mm -hmm. um, because there are always risks involved. Risk. Litigation mm -hmm. risks and risks in general. Mm -hmm. From your perspective, what are the risks for Belize if we do go ahead and take the Guatemalans' claim to the ICJ? Well, the first thing I need to say, it's not Belize taking Guatemala's claim. The emphasis is going to be on Guatemala. Yes. There is a, a legal principle which says he who asserts must, must prove. prove. Hmm? So if Guatemala wants to succeed, they have to prove. Yeah. So they are going to have to prove that since the 1400s, that's the 524 years, they have exercised, whether through Spain or other ways, a 
authority over this. There is no evidence. I, I don't. I deal in um, uh, legal principles. Okay, yeah. so this is not about yes, no. This mm -hmm. is just the legal analysis. Um, I w I've been a lawyer since 1977. I am still only 21. <laughs> <laughs> I was born that year, so. <laughs> there you go. Um, and um, I have, I was the Attorney General of the United Kingdom. I'm a Deputy High Court Judge. This is what I'm used to doing, analysis, right? yes. legal analysis. No emotion, mm -hmm. just objectivity. And any of us, when we're looking at a case, has to look at the pros and has to look at the cons. Yes, and sure. normally, there are areas where you think, well, this is how mm -hmm. they could make their case. And my difficulty is, jurisprudentially, when you look at the case for Guatemala, I can't see how they're going to make it. Now, they can say this was um, uh, a decision made by Spain, and Spain had this. So you're going to go back to 1494. Then you can say, well, there was um, a part of the treaty in 1859 which said that the United Kingdom had to give uh, a bridge, mm -hmm. and they didn't give the bridge. However, the 1859 treaty was a treaty to determine borders. So I am struggling here. <laughs> I'm trying to see what the <laughs> argument's going to be, because yeah. I agree with you. There's always two sides of a story, yeah. and it's very unusual for there not to be a material case that you can put forward to yeah. Guatemala. I can't jurisprudentially see the way in which yeah. they are going to put their case. Can I, can I just, because we, we mentioned the 1859 treaty, and I think that's one of the areas that we've heard uh, those who are pushing for a no vote mention, that when there's failure to fulfill one portion of a treaty, it leaves the rest of what was agreed upon questionable. Well, not when it's a treaty to deal yeah. with territorial boundaries. And the, the other thing that you have to think about is what was said at the time the treaty was signed, but by both parties. Mm -hmm. So you go back and you look at uh, what was said by Belize, and you go back and you look at what was said by Guatemala, and you examine what, why Guatemala said in 1859 that they were accepting the determination of that boundary. Mm -hmm. okay? So that, those are the parameters. Yeah. parameters. And then you ask another question. After the treaty, was there an acceptance by the two parties of that treaty? And was there an exercise after 1859 of Guatemala over the territorial integrity of Belize? Ever. At all. Mm -hmm. And the answer, as far as I'm aware, now I may not be correct, yeah. but this is what I'm aware on the facts, what I'm told, is the answer to that question is no. Absolutely. So for over 110 years, there is no dispute. Yeah. Now let's pretend I am sitting as a judge in the International Court of Justice. Mm -hmm. Now those are my facts. I don't know whether Guatemala is going to come up with something else, but those are the known facts to date. There is always mm -hmm. uh, fear about litigation, always, always. However, you have to weigh up the risks, and usually there is a way that you can say, well, they could say this. And if they said this, we'll and they could say that, and that's how we lawyers will yeah. never say to you that it is 100%, percent. okay? However, what you try to do is you try to analyze what is their argument mm -hmm. and what is the argument they could bring which would enable, because you can't just say, I woke up this morning and I felt like giving it to Guatemala. Right? <laughs> you have to say, there has to be a basis upon which I can say there's a question. Yeah. 
Can, can and the I, territorial yeah. occupation is, is the most important point. I want to bring an, another aspect just before we move on. The, the Sarstun is where we see a lot of the issues today in Belize. And it is an area of huge concern. We're very happy to hear our foreign minister uh, uh, speak openly at the UN about this issue and, and uh, urging Guatemala to agree to a protocol. We've had one former foreign minister call what's taking place in the Sarstun an annexation of sorts. And I, I, I want to hear your opinion on this because we are seeing where Guatemalans are exerting control, maybe not on territory. Well, technically, Sarstun Island is land, um, but they are exerting control in that area. But you know one of the things that I need to be clear about? I am not sitting here as the lawyer <laughs> for Guatemala or the yeah. lawyer for um, Belize. Yeah. And it's actually improper mm -hmm. for me to opine mm -hmm. on something which is out with mm -hmm. the roles that I have in relation to the, being the Secretary General of the 53 countries, the 2.4 billion. I'm able to talk about what the Commonwealth's view is mm -hmm. and not what the allegations may be made about annexation or others. So it's, in, it's embroiling me mm -hmm. in something which is a local issue, mm -hmm. which has to be determined by people other than me. But all I can do is to say it's clearly this is an issue which needs to be settled. And the international community's way of settling disputes is for to invite, which is what the 53 countries, including uh, Belize, mm -hmm. what the 53 countries have been saying for a long time is that they believe mm -hmm. that the best way of settling it would be to go and take all of these issues to the ICJ. Because once the ICJ has made that decision, there is then clarity. And you've got to ask another question. Mm -hmm. if not this, what? Um, if not this process of settlement, how mm -hmm. is it going to be settled? Because at the end of the day, there is a methodology available and it will be ironic if one party who was never playing ball and was never going to come to the table, everyone believed, mm -hmm. <laughs> says yes, and the one with more ballast mm -hmm. says no. But you know what? That's democracy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, um, one of the things you spoke about was clarity. And one of th another reason why I appreciate your voice mm -hmm. at this time is because in Belize we need clarity. Mm. To go to your analogy of playing ball, it's kind of like you are the better ball player for years yeah. and then you become old and you become injured <laughs> and the person who was supposed to play ball with you knows that you need maybe five weeks to recover but that person wants to play mm. ball now yeah. and so you might want to play ball with that person but you might say listen this is not, this the, right is not the time mm. i'm injured you're smart you came now yes. and want to go now so that's one issue mm. i wanted to go back to i'm loading them on because we're running out of time mm. And, and I really want well, to I haven't to spoken about any but, of the but, things but, about that. Sure, sure, sure. Yes, sure. Yes. But it's, it's kind of like when you're hungry, Jesus fed the... <laughs> give them five loaves of fishes before he talked to them about going to heaven. That's right. We're kind of hungry. Um, and so please give us our, yeah. our five loaves and uh, mm. two fishes. But the other issue is, as a lawyer, mm. as an international lawyer, mm. and one of the best, mm. you'll appreciate that in terms of clarity, when you're articulating what the strengths are, Mm -hmm. that when you go to court, your pleadings are what you look at. Mm -hmm. So these public pronouncements by the lawyers might mm -hmm. be what they are. In fact, they might be a ploy. Mm -hmm. I might tell somebody, mm -hmm. I have a weak case, man. There's no way I'm going to win this. But I know my ace in my pocket is that mm -hmm. in my pleadings, I have an ace in the hole. Mm -hmm. We have been able to look very squarely at what the pleadings, the defense probabilities will be. Mm -hmm. But we don't know the details of the pleading. OK. Let me help, because um, uh, Guatemala articulated its case very fully back in 2002. And uh, you're right, 
you have to plead it. You can't just, there's not trial by ambush. All right. Okay, you can't just say, oh, okay, yeah, back pocket. <laughs> 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 you can't do, uh -uh, nothing good. As my father would say, nothing goes so. So, so what happens is both sides have to plead their case. And remember, it is not Belize pleading its case as to why sovereignty is theirs. Guatemala has to plead her case as to why she says, contrary to what everybody else says, that she's entitled to any part of Belizean territory. So once Guatemala puts that case, the case for Belize then gets to deconstruct it, to say this, 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 this. And that's the problem, because one of the, I ha I ha I'm glad that I can put these things to you, and you can articulately respond to them. Because one of the arguments, one of the difficulties that some of the persons who are against it have is that we have been asked an open-ended question. Do you agree to take this claim to the ICJ for its resolution? But we have no details as to what the claim well, is. But the and thing so is, after we've jumped in, what if they... No, no, because uh, but I think you need so to... I'm going to articulate yeah, what because, the concern because, is. Because um, the, the Guatemalans claim has been iterated for 41 years, okay? So they have put forward at various times all the things that they contend would be capable of giving them a claim. So when it goes to the ICJ, you don't just pull out of your pocket 41 years later something that you hadn't mentioned for 41 years, okay? So we know as well as we can know all the things they've said and there's an opinion on their opinion mm -hmm. as to why everything they've said yes. is contended and in dispute and the international community has looked at that claim. Okay? So, for, so you've got the 43 countries who will have uh, a legal department in those 43 countries, uh, 53, 53 countries of the Commonwealth and we, the 53 countries of the Commonwealth, who have the same common law as uh, Belize and who interpret the issues in the same way, have come to the conclusion that the sovereignty of Belize is in accordance with that which is contended by Belize, not Guatemala. And remember, common law, which is our way of doing things, is the basis of international law. So we know that the principles upon which we define what the legal position is will be similar to, if not identical with, the international law. So the fact that Guatemala may have civil law civil or law. civil code or good, f I'm not saying good for them, because that would be <laughs> so, but, but they still have to comply with international law. Yeah. And so I think one of the things I'd really like people to do is separate out local issues from international legal issues. Mm -hmm. And the international legal position has been relatively clear for a very long time. So to go back to your analysis of the tired player and the new player. Yeah. The tired player has won all the games. Hmm? And the whistle has been blown. And the uh, referee is watching. And the referee isn't just going to look at what could be done in extra time, because this player is asking for extra time. And the referee is saying, I'm sorry, the game is over. <laughs> so, um, so these are tensions you will never say yeah. there is no concern. Okay? Because if any of us go into these things, we're worried. But the worry has to be based on fact and law. Yeah. And I am not saying for a moment there isn't concern. What I am saying is just try and separate out some of the emotions. Mm -hmm. And people say things and they upset you. Mm -hmm. They really yes. upset you. <laughs> and then you can feel mad. 
Okay, and, I, and that's totally human, totally understandable. But I, the moment we come to make a decision, we have to think about the consequences of having fought for so long. Whether you want to lose because you're frightened. And it, we're all, we aren't talking about fear. Yeah. We're talking about yeah. fear. None of us, when I have this in my hand, I'm saying I'd rather keep what I have in my hand, you know, that what's in my hand, than, and you're telling me this is better over here, but... Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. And we understand that. But uh, Belize is not alone in this. Hmm? It's not as if we're saying it's Belize against Guatemala. Guatemala has 14 million. Mm -hmm. Belize have 380. Guatemala has 14 million. No. Belize has 2.4 billion. And Guatemala yeah. has 14 million. Can, can, we join, can we join the Commonwealth onto the claim as a party? Can we have <laughs> an interested party? So we have well, a book on paper? Well, can we do is, that? You're the, the, head. the can thing we do is, that? The thing is, you, I can <laughs> promise you, um, Belize has backup. Yeah. Because um, that's what happened in New York. You know? Mm -hmm. uh, every year, we have a committee on Belize. Mm -hmm. And until this dispute with Guatemala, is finally concluded every year we will continue have to committee on Gu on Belize and Guatemala and the Commonwealth will continue to say we stand we stand with our member state yeah. and we stand with Belize not because uh, she's a family member alone we but stand right. with her because she's right she's right and um, so that's what um, I hope will give some comfort to the yeah. people of Belize. You do not stand alone. You stand with 2.4 billion people, mm -hmm. which is not bad. Can, can one I, third of the world's population. Can I ask one final question a little bit outside of, mm -hmm. of that? Um, I was looking through the notes in relation to the work that Commonwealth has been doing with some mm -hmm. of its member states. Yes. And one interesting uh, category was urban violence. Yes. 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 Um, Belize is at a place now where, like, another Commonwealth sister, yeah. Jamaica. Yes. And I, I'm not sure, I think Trinidad is also mm -hmm. facing similar mm -hmm. challenges mm -hmm. in terms of urban mm -hmm. violence. Um, that what can be CARICOM's input in terms mm -hmm. of helping us to move away from what is the fruit of crime, but the, the root is really economic difficulty. Yeah. And region. that's why I wanted to talk about yeah. all the things that we're doing. And yeah. I really would like everyone to go and look at our new website which is called thecommonwealth.org because we have so many things in common good things but also bad things mm -hmm. in terms of our problems and it's a way of us coming together to look at how we can do better so for example when i was um, criminal justice minister in the united kingdom we reduced crime to the lowest level it had been since 1981 we also reduced domestic violence by 64% and we saved 7.1 billion economic cost a year. Now, there is a way for us to restructure our civil and criminal justice system to give a more holistic response to our people, mm -hmm. reduce crime and enhance our productivity. So just to keep one little fact that we saw, there is a direct correlation between what a child will achieve at 22 months and what the same person will achieve at 22 years. Yeah. So early intervention is really important. How we nurture our children, how we support the mothers, how we keep people safe. If you go onto the website, you will see we have all of our work online. Wow. So we've said before we used to have the Commonwealth in our hearts, yeah. Now we have it in the palm of our hand, one tap away. So everything we're doing on governance and peace, we have an Office of Civil and Criminal Justice Reform. All the um, model laws mm -hmm. are all there. We've got trade and oceans, what we're doing about small and medium-sized enterprise, because the majority of the small and medium-sized enterprises are women 
and young people, and we know that can drive. Mm -hmm. But if you look at and ask yourself a question, what do the six biggest global companies at the moment have in common? And a lot of people don't realize that they all started small. Mm -hmm. Google, yeah. Alibaba, look at them. They started in a garage. Mm -hmm. So we okay. have just as much talent here in our small islands as they have in the bigger countries. And we need to pull together and give that innovation. We've created an innovation hub and we are in the process of creating a Commonwealth Innovation Fund, the global Commonwealth, uh, the Global Innovation Fund is going to help us. So we're going to raise 25 million pounds to enable small uh, uh, enterprise to try and take into account this innovative opportunity. And last, Friday before last, I launched the Commonwealth Innovation Awards. So there is so much we're doing yeah. on trade, on governance, on peace, on economics, on issues in relation to our children. We're talking about de-risking for our banks. Yes. How do we get climate change more resilient? How we, do we create a regenerative model of development? All of those things are about our future. And that's where I would really want Belize to concentrate. We have to, yes, sort out this issue of territorial um, integrity because it's like a cloud hanging over. Hanging over and yeah. we just have to get rid of that cloud. But there is work for us to do, real work for us to do. Yeah. And Belize is a country of beauty and talented people. It's a brilliant combination. And That's right. I think we need to concentrate on harvesting that brilliance as opposed to being forever threatened and clouded by this issue of territorial integrity. So I would love to come back another time and really talk about women and well, talk wanted, about our children and talk closing about closing our question. trade. Yeah. One closing question, because I really love it that we said it in the beginning and to close it off in the end. You said your mandate or your, your, your priority coming in as the Secretary General was to put the wealth back in Commonwealth and the common back in wealth. Absolutely. From what you are seeing with the agreements between these 53 countries and the direction that we're moving, what are you most optimistic about? I am... Um, really optimistic on trade because of the similarities of our business mm -hmm. world. Um, we can remove some of these barriers. And you know, for how long have we been saying in the Caribbean that if and when Africa opens up, there's opportunities for us? It's opening up now. And we don't need a lot of the pie in our countries, our small countries mm -hmm. in the Caribbean. We just need a small piece. <laughs> and I can see that this interaction, what we're doing on creating small and medium-sized businesses, the fact that we launched a network in India, yeah. uh, we now have one in the Pacific, we've got another one coming in Africa, we need one in yeah. the uh, Caribbean. The fact that we have got the small state center coming, the opportunities that we have for trade. We've got a 500 million pound opportunity for loans. We're going to go to um, the finance minister's meeting in Bali and we're going to be talking about creating a portal, a financial portal, which will help our countries to better access aid. We are talking about how we can move together on uh, the issues of climate to make a more regenerative development. Yeah. This is real excitement. We've got the blue charter, which um, came out of my head, but it's been agreed <laughs> by 53 countries. We came up with that idea in June. It was done by April. Normally, these international agreements take 10 years, I'm told. We did it in less than 10 months. Yeah. That's exciting. We're doing things and we're doing it together. Um, and I really want us to be looking at our future mm -hmm. and the future for our children, that we are stronger and better. And that's why I think it's an exciting time to be one of our 53, because we actually do agree 
about what a common future means. And we actually like each other. <laughs> a it's pretty, always a good start. That's <laughs> always a good start. Thank you so much for joining us this morning and taking mm. the time yes. out of your schedule to be with us. Yes. No, no. God bless. And uh, God bless the people of Belize. Beautiful people. All right. We are going to go ahead and take a break. When we come back, we'll be talking to Help Age Belize about the International Day of Older Persons. So stay tuned.